Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Nicole Quinn. Welcome to the Lab Coats and Life podcast, where we help scientists thrive. My co-host today is Dr. Jason Goldsmith, co-host of the Immunology podcast. The Lab Coats and Life podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life sciences research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Lab Coats and Life podcast, rate us and leave a review. You can also suggest ideas or recommend guests for new episodes. Today we have Dr. Nima Najan from the University of Calgary on to talk about his experience scaling up and commercializing research. Dr. Najan has a PhD in medical genetics and an MSc in cell biology and has shifted his career to working with scientists to commercialize their research findings. With a decade of experience supporting the commercialization of early stage technologies, Nima combines his understanding of science and engineering with knowledge of intellectual property, licensing, and business to devise commercialization strategies for life sciences companies. Nima runs the Life Sciences Innovation Hub at the University of Calgary and is a strong advocate for the life sciences sector in Alberta, Canada. Before we get to that, are you enjoying listening to the Lab Coats and Life podcast? Are there other soft skills, topics, or questions about your life in a lab coat that you'd like to learn more about? Visit www.stemcell.com slash suggest topics to tell us what you're passionate about and we will endeavor to cover it via Stem Cell Technologies mentorship resources. Thank you, Nima, for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to give you an opportunity to just introduce yourself. Tell us about yourself and, and the, the work that you're doing today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I think my story kind of, as you said, during the intro really started off in academia. And for a long time, I thought academia is what I want to do. And it wasn't nearly until the end of my PhD that I decided maybe academia is not what I want to do, which in terms of life choices, probably should have made that choice a little bit earlier because by the time you do your master's and PhD, and I was looking to do postdocs, uh, you know, maybe I could have pivoted. But in retrospect, I think where I am today probably wouldn't have happened had I not gone through that academic route. And so I'm happy to be where I am right now. I'm working very closely with lots of startup companies in Alberta, in Calgary, and supporting their whole journey, the entrepreneurial journey from when they come out of a lab typically from a university where they've made a really interesting discovery and turning that discovery into a product. And there's lots of steps in there and happy to get into as much detail as you like, but, but it's just a fun place to be. It's a fun kind of being at that intersection between academia and the business world. Awesome. Well, I can speak to um, that realization late in academia that maybe you should have thought this through a bit differently and figured out where you're going with it, but also ending up in the right place. And I think Jason can too. He's he's in a similar world to you, Jason. Why don't you give us an introduction to yourself and uh, and you know w where you fit in this story of commercialization? Sure. So I, I was in academia until a senior postdoc, junior faculty grants were in, and my PI decided to go to China one day and not come back. <laughs> And then I turned on my job o meter, and I'm a physician scientist, and I ended up landing at uh, Ceres Therapeutics, which is a microbiome company, and I helped commercialize their first product. So we just got our FDA approval in April of this year, and so I was involved in that post phase three to commercialization, like super launch and still kind of going through that because once you have your license, it doesn't mean you have a full commercial scale process. So I've been heavily involved in late stage commercialization, but then in in grad school, I was involved in some early kickstarting commercialization and like that very first like step from academia into industry. So like Penn Innovation Center had some grant competitions. And so they had faculty work with postdocs and others to compete and earn those and then start like, you know, pre-series A funding. And so I've kind of I've done the gamut and then done a little bit of consulting for early and mid-stage biotechs as well in, in my lifespan. So I, I, I've worked with a, a other versions of Calgary's, um, your institute, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, Calgary itself as a city is pretty early into the whole life sciences commercialization game. I mean, obviously, the, the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Calgary has been around for a long time, but we haven't had a lot of programs to support companies in Calgary or in the life sciences space. And it wasn't really until 2019 when Innovate Calgary launched the Life Sciences Innovation Hub that we really had a concerted effort to say, like, this is going to be the focus 
um, at least for now, we've launched several hubs since then uh, based on the success of the Life Science Innovation Hub, but really trying to give people like yourself like a space and resources to commercialize their ideas once they're coming spinning technologies out of the university. Awesome. So, so I wanted to ask a question about the landscape today because, and I don't know if this is just the world I, I am living in, but I'm hearing commercialization, commercialization all the time. And how do you do GMP and how do you get through the regulatory world and how do you take an idea and, and, and make money off of it? And I don't know if that is just because this is where science is today, where we've science has matured to the point where we're actually seeing some of this research we've been doing for so long applied. Or if it's, and maybe it's a combination of all of this, it's that there are there's now more rigor and organization and support behind these processes. And so we're now talking about it a little bit more, whereas it used to just happen behind the scenes. But I don't know if you have any thoughts thoughts on that, but why is this so buzzy lately? Yeah, I mean, I would say part of the pressure comes from the funding organizations that are really putting more and more emphasis on not just basic science, but translational research. And that obviously trickles downstream. But I remember when I was doing my PhD, master's writing grant applications, you, it, and all of what I did was essentially basic science. So you write this huge proposal, and at the very last paragraph, you say, oh yeah, by the way, if this works out, it might work out to a cure for cancer or something down the road. And it's just kind of a throwaway paragraph at the end, just to make your research sound relevant. Now, many of the grant applications, like half the application itself is on how you're going to take this idea to the market. How is it going to benefit society? How is it going to make the world a better place? And that emphasis by grant organizations has trickled down to a lot of the resources that we're putting in place now to take in all of the research that is much more translational in, in nature nowadays um, and bring those to the market. So and universities increasingly also are putting an emphasis on translational research. And, and to be honest, I did a basic science master's and PhD, and I think there's a lot of value for basic science because ultimately it builds the foundation on which all of this translational research takes place. So if you think about the very top of the pyramid being translational research, you still need that huge foundation to support all of that. But, but I would say definitely society as a whole has veered away more from basic science um, and really funding more of these. And the universities, as I was mentioning, uh, I mean, the University of Calgary, for example, has positioned itself as we want to be the most entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial university in Canada. And for the last three years in a row, it has created more startup companies than any other university. It's more than U of T, more than UBC. And so by putting resources into becoming more entrepreneurial and changing the culture within the university, we're starting to see that whole buzz around commercialization and taking research out of the lab and into the market. To add a little bit, I think the other thing that's happened is pharma and other groups that used to do a lot of the early stage research, like they'd see a paper from a professor and just run and take it. You've had two things happening. One now pharma tends to wait for the biotechs to do the early risk work and like outsource that. So they'll let the early investors, we can talk about all that, but all that early money do the first early phase one, phase two testing and then buy. So you're shifting the risk from them to these other industries. And then two, you now have universities much more interested in their patents. And so now there's intellectual property that universities are developing as a way of them to generating revenue. Whereas before some paper professor just publish a paper and then, oh, there's the cure for cancer in it, so to speak, right? To keep that analogy going, it's published, you can't patent it now. And so that happens less and you know, universities will, before you publish, review it and say, you know, you should patent this, let's hold the paper for a few months and get the provisional patent going and then publish. And so now there's IP and so now you need a company and you need to license it. And there's the whole thing there with protections that didn't used to exist before. So I think there's the, those, those factors as well are driving I think groups like NEMA has, right? And I don't know if you want to talk, NEMA, about what an innovation center is, not just yours specifically, but what the purpose of these are. Penn has one, I know, there's Y Combinator, there's all these different ones that exist throughout the world now. Uh, but what, where do they fit in this ecosphere? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
the reason why innovation centers exist and all of the programs that we have exist is because most of the people we deal with have a technical background. Coming out of coming out with a PhD or postdoc and a really great idea, they understand the science, they don't understand the business. And so we are help here to help them on the business side of things. And we have lots of programs to support that. And every city, every major city in the country certainly will have some kind of incubator space for early stage companies. Some of them will focus on a specific industry, some of them are more sector agnostic. And for the Life Sciences Innovation Hub, what we do is we have a combination of things that we bring into every hub at Innovate Calgary. Um, and it's a combination of supports. And that includes one, accelerator programming aimed at really early stage, early entrepreneurs who essentially have no experience in running a company. And so we have a program, for example, the Life Sciences uh, Fellowship, where we put $200,000 into each of four companies a year. And these are typically freshly formed companies and sometimes even pre-company formation where the, the founders are coming in with a really great idea. And it's open to anybody from anywhere in the world uh, to come and take advantage of this program. And then we give them two years of business training because it takes decades to learn the science, but we can give you most of what you need to know in, in a two-year period uh, on the business side. Uh, I mean, no one's going to be an expert by the end, but at least you have all the tools you need to go in front of VCs and start getting actual uh, investment into your company. So uh, that's been a really popular program. Other programs that we have that really support early stage entrepreneurs is things like a seed fund. So we have in health, 5 million in general health, 5 million in child health, and 3 million in neuroscience that we put specifically at very early stage companies much earlier than most angels would get involved and certainly much earlier than any VC would um, get involved. Can we just define what an what an angel and a VC is for for our just different classes of investors? So angel investors are typically very very early, high risk, high reward. They'll put a smaller amount of money into a company, but take a bigger chunk because the company is unproven at that stage. And the VCs are the ones with deeper pockets. Will fund maybe a phase one, phase two, and the really big VCs might be able to fund a phase three clinical trial, but. Um, it's just investors that come in at different stages. Well, our money's even earlier than that before even the angels will touch it. And typically we'll coming in as the first money into a company. Um, and that has been a game changer for the city as well. And what we find is because we do so much diligence on the companies, as much as you can do on an early stage company, that for every dollar that we invest, they get $16 from other investors. Because once they have the UC stamp of approval, um, all of these other investors say, oh, maybe I'll get in on that opportunity as well. And then at least in our definition of support, we also have access to labs. So we have level two molecular biology labs, um, over $3 million worth of equipment. We have rapid prototyping labs available for medical device companies. So companies that might need access to 3D printers or CNC or electronic uh, equipment. And then we have advisors. So we have a network of over 100 advisors across the country that the entrepreneurs and the companies can tap into, and each advisor is an expert in their specific field. So whether it's pharmaceuticals or HR or regulatory affairs, IP, whatever, and we pair these up one-on-one -on -one with the companies. And so at least in our mind, the combination of what a hub is, is those specific supports to try and get these very inexperienced entrepreneurs out the gate and successful. So it's really not for the 10 times serial entrepreneurial who knows what they're doing. It's for those early stage people who don't know what they're doing. Amazing, amazing. Um, I, it's such a new idea because yeah, I was in academia, I don't know, 12-ish years ago and this wasn't the kind of thing that was really being talked about. I think it was happening behind the scenes. Well, I think everyone had to be scrappy and figure it out for themselves. So the fact that these support systems are are being established or are established is, is fantastic. So what, what does a scientist who, as you say, is an expert in the science and the technical stuff um, have to do? What are the boxes they have to check or the steps they have to um, have kind of overcome themselves before coming to you and actually being eligible for this support? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, a large portion of self-identification as an entrepreneur. I, I believe entrepreneurship, I mean, it's not for everybody. You have to really want to be an entrepreneur. It's almost like a personality trait. And so not everyone should be an entrepreneur. And so people do naturally self-select and say, 
I, I, and it's not the type of person that's like, I want to be my own boss. That's typically not the type of person we get because those are the people that might create a bakery or something like that so they can run to their own hours, uh, although bakeries are terrible hours. But, um, uh, but it's more people who really love an idea and want to take it to the next stage. And as Jason was alluding to earlier, like with fewer and fewer companies really looking at early stage technologies, and, and, and so I spent the first five, year, five years of my career on the IP side of things, taking research that was happening at the University of Calgary, filing a patent on it, and then trying to shop it around to large pharma to see who would buy it. But increasingly, no one wants to buy it because it's so early stage um, and it's very, very risky. And the reality is many times university research can't necessarily even be replicated, right? So for them to pay licensing fees and bring on a technology, um, didn't make a lot of sense. So increasingly, we are seeing them coming further and further in development, waiting until a company is doing phase two and then acquiring the company. Yes, it costs them more for that acquisition, but they it costs them less in the long run because they're not putting so much money in the early stage high risk stuff. So so really, it's, it's the people who want to be an entrepreneur and the people who are coachable. I think that, you know, typically... And we'll re reject a lot of applications to various programmings for people who we deem as not coachable. People who come in is like, yeah, yeah, I know everything I'm doing. This is a really great idea. I'm just, I just need money to to prove this is a really great idea. And like, that's almost never the first step. The first step is almost always doing customer discovery, market validation, understanding where your product fits within a much larger market, understanding whether the problem you're solving is even a real problem for anyone outside of yourself. So. Those check boxes have to be kind of answered, and we can help people answer those. But uh, but really, it's it's part of this. It's all part of the process. So I wanted to like maybe we could walk through the whole process from crazy idea with a patent to to cure to you know commercialization. So I'm going to come up with a really ridiculous example, partially because I think it'll get to market research. So I have a cure that works for cancer in the left ear. Doesn't work in the right ear. There's reasons. But left ear cancer, I cure with an 80% cure rate. The best thing on the market's 30% with chemo and you're half deaf. I don't have that problem. But in my mouse models, I can cure left ear cancer. And they have hearing at the end. And so I have a patent. I worked with my university. And I got a patent for my you know, left cure. And now I, I come and knock on your door. So what happens next? First, I mean, one of the first questions you have is how often... Do people get, or this is people, we're not, we don't care about cures and mice. So, uh, you know, how often do people get ke uh, cancer only in the left ear? Um, you do a market assessment, then understand how much it's going to cost to bring your mark, your drug to the market. And not that to say there aren't any space for orphan diseases or diseases that are very rare because there are specific business models where you can make a decent chunk of money off orphan diseases. It's just harder. It's a harder path to go down. Uh, but so once you do a little bit of market research, then you also have to understand the nature of your cure, right? I'm assuming it's, a, let's just say it's a small molecule for the sake of argument. You know, understanding whether it's a druggable molecule, like does it get to where it needs to go? Does it have any toxicity? All of those kinds of like, what we you know, typically will call preclinical work. Well, at least a large portion will happen in a university lab and it's not to the standards required to the fda by the fda and health canada to do a clinical trial yet but really understanding how efficacious your model is or your molecule is understanding if you need to modify it in any way to reduce toxicity increase the amount of time it stays inside your body how it's secreted all of those things need to be answered before you even take the next steps and the that's typically falls into the realm of somewhat academic research is kind of getting into the gray area of like, there's not a lot of funding for that kind of research, but, uh, but it, it, it does need to be answered before you really start taking steps towards commercializing it. So is that where I'm going to come and knock on your door and maybe I get some startup funds for like, I look, it looks good. The mice looks good with my bootstrapped uh, research experiments in the lab, but I need that not quite GLP biodistribution study or a talk basic mouse talk study. And, and that's what I'm going to get from, you know, an innovation center like yours before I go uh, get my angels. Possibly. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's it's really kind of that early stage validation for which not a lot of funders are out there paying. Uh, and certainly no angel is going to pay for that kind of uh, 
research. So that's where you would come to us and we could potentially help you and say, okay. Uh, but also most academics don't know the whole drug development process. And so we were talking about drugs specifically here, but uh, you know, really understanding your next step is you need to do GLP preclinical and you need to start setting up your clinical trial, understanding what your regulatory path looks like, uh, you know, maybe writing a clinical trial. We have a whole group dedicated to helping companies with regulatory affairs. So coming up with a clinical trial protocol, maybe some timelines because left ear cancer might be, you know, one in a hundred thousand patients. Where are you going to find these patients, right? So recruitment becomes an issue with those kinds of things. And so we can help with all of those kind of downstream questions. Amazing. I have a question about that kind of relates to something you were saying earlier, where you have to be the right kind of person to do this. You have to, you know, have an entrepreneurial personality. I feel like we are asking a lot of our scientists these days, they have to be teachers and mentors and actual scientists and, you know, have that inquisitive mind, blah, blah, blah. Also be science communicators because they have to now interface with the public and be a champion for the work that they do, you know, even politically sometimes. And now we're also asking them to have business acumen and be entrepreneurs. So um, I don't even know what the question is in here, but like how... These poor scientists. You know, how, how do we how do we cope with that? And and I don't know. You know, the the earlier on you were saying that most grants now require this application piece to be in there. And is that is something happening to science that we don't necessarily want to happen? Maybe that's the question. Um, that that is a deep philosophical ideological it is, it question. Is. That's where I go with these things. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm a huge supporter of basic science. I think there's always going to, and and it's like any other thing. We the pendulum tends to swing kind of to the extremes, and sometimes you're only funding basic science, sometimes you're finding only funding translational science. So it, we will need to at some point come to a balance between um, what we want to fund as a society. But um, but in terms of your question of you know scientists becoming entrepreneurs it's absolutely challenging and and it's it's challenging from twofold obviously from the time perspective because who's got time to also learn entrepreneurship when you're doing your research but also from a cultural perspective because i can tell you like academics are very often opposed to changing how they're doing things and being asked hey now don't do basic science, do translational science. And so that cultural shift, that cultural change can be very difficult to overcome. And the worst part is, even though these expectations are there on principal investigators to do more translational research, create startups, file patents, whatever, there is currently no uh, way of recognizing, and most universities don't have a way of recognizing those efforts and contributions. Um, and so when they're getting their performance review and they're figuring out whether they should be tenured or not. Like they're looking at their H index, they're looking at the publication, students, whatever. Seldom do they look at, you've got a startup company that's really successful or you filed 30 patents that were licensed. Um, and so we need to, as as academic institutions, really reevaluate how we evaluate uh, students, faculty members on their commercialization efforts and factor that into the whole equation. Do you know if Canada has certifications for clinical or translational work for PhDs? I know in the U.S. we have um, some NIH-funded sites called CTSAs, which do a lot of clinical trial stuff, but then part of that is that if you're a PhD student, you can go do a one-year course work and get a cert that says, like, you, you understand this and then kind of Aren't, aren't the person that's being forced to change when you're then a faculty member? I don't know if that's happened with you guys, if you've seen that type of thing on your end of... There there are definitely certifications on the regulatory affairs side of things. And in fact, if there's any lot of students I would imagine that are listening to this, that is an extremely high demand career move um, and they get paid quite handsomely. So um, if that's something that you would consider pursuing, I would highly recommend it because every company who's doing any kind of human work is going to need to do clinical trials. It's it's the non-starter. And so that it's in such high demand and such low supply right now that we actually have very difficult uh, time finding, filling those positions in the startup companies that we incubate. Well, as someone who works in biotech assert that the regulatory affairs and clinical trial supervision is indeed a great uh, 
career that always has jobs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Hot tip, hot tip for people. Uh, I have a question that I'm, I'm not sure how well you can answer, but maybe both of you could, could opine on this is, you know, we've talked a little bit about what this looks like in Canada and the U.S., North America centric standard. Um, but is this what we're also seeing globally? Are you, is, is, are these sorts of hubs popping up all over the world and are, is this the trend for, um, scientific research, uh, everywhere? I mean, I'm not, I, I don't know fully what's going on in Europe and other countries in terms of this transition away. I, I would say globally, we are definitely seeing more and more cities and jurisdictions using incubators and support for life sciences companies uh, as an economic diversification play, which in, in essence, that's what Innovate Calgary and the Life Sciences Innovation Hub is set up to do. Calgary, Alberta in general is very heavily reliant on the oil and gas industry for a lot of the revenue that we generate. Um, and given the fate of the oil and gas industry in the next 20 or 30 years, I think most governments are starting to recognize this and starting to diversify and not just oil and gas. I mean, in Alberta, oil and gas, but in other industries, it might be manufacturing or other things that may have moved out of those cities. But those cities see life sciences as a huge opportunity because most universities, a big chunk of the research revenue goes to the medical school to do medical research. And because of that, that also generates the most amount of IP and translational ideas. And so to capitalize on that and not have the companies leave to go to other jurisdictions after you've made this huge investment into their research, uh, you have to set up centers like the Life Science Innovation Hub uh, to to encourage these companies to stay and do their research and hopefully be successful locally. Yeah, so biotech, biotech as a sector is growing because of that fundamental where pharma invests and pharma isn't just us i mean Takeda's japanese right uh glaxo smith klein is in the uk pick pick a company there's plenty that are not us centric right that are international companies how incubators work is a little variable there's some more state-based and so the state because all the universities are state-based or more of them and so they'll incubate it out and the state will get a licensing agreement versus the versus Harvard, the private university. But but there is a there is that bridge need. And so whether it's through a university like explicit incubator there or a third party incubator, it is a growing field because you have to get these biotechs up and running to get funding. And those fundings are still angels in venture capital and and then until you get into an IPO which is a stock offering of some form. And that can be on any market, right? But you, you have to get there and then get bought. And that's, and that's the game. I have a question. Thank you for that. I have a question um, back to you, what you were saying about scientists aren't necessarily recognized for their startups and for having, having IP um, in terms of their promotions or like, you know, in, in their faculty positions, what monetarily um, is is in it uh, like how does that tend to work if a scientist is behind an idea and obviously they've commercialized it in, in um, with a university how does that tend to work yeah so it varies from university to university based on their IP policy at the University of Calgary we have one of the most entrepreneurial entrepreneur friendly IP policies across the country we just take a flat percentage of the company, it's extremely low. Um, and that really has been vetted with all the investors that we work with, um, with the local accelerators that we work with. Um, and that whole agreement was done in collaboration with these groups so that it is acceptable. Because a lot of times what we find is the the tech transfer office, which almost every university has, puts together an agreement for a startup company that ultimately stands in the way of that startup company raising money because of all the clawbacks and provisions that they put in there. So we've created our whole documents, all of the agreements that we have in collaboration with investors. So we, we make sure we are never in the way of commercialization. So um, yeah, I think with that respect, in terms of 
getting money back if you own as an inventor, as a faculty member, whoever you are, a big chunk of the company and the company is successful, that's where you will stand to benefit. Of course, entrepreneurship is about taking risks. So there's no guarantee that you'll make any money. You're going to put all of this time and effort and ultimately your startup might fail. And that's why I, I, I think it's actually not for everybody because very few people are willing to necessarily take that risk. But I would caveat that uh, is that most of the time we find that it's not the faculty member themselves whose lab generates the IP that ultimately ends up running the startup company. They can sit back, continue their day jobs as uh, you know scientists at the university, act as a chief technical officer um, at the university uh, at the company, so they can act as more of an advisory role. But it would be one of their students who would then go and run the company. Uh, and that's that's the programs that we set up is to enable the students who are in that lab, who just graduated with a postdoc, like I don't know what to do with my life, uh, to go and run these companies. Um, and, and you know, it's not just that I don't know what to do with my life. They're usually quite passionate about becoming entrepreneurs, but they may not necessarily have a direct path to becoming faculty at a different university. So those people, when they go to create those startup companies, we try and support and then ultimately hopefully become commercially successful. So real quick, you you get through you guys. I want to make sure, because I know it and you know it, the business, but I want to make sure people who are listening to this, I'm a postdoc, my PI and I came up with this left ear thing. I get through you guys. We kind of talked about that. I have some good data. I have an angel investor now. I get my IND, so now I can do clinical trials. Where do you see the end game? And we've kind of hinted at, but where do you see the end game? Like I have a clinical trial, it's going well. Where's the end game you think for most of these academic startups? Where do you think they end up going? When, if, if, they, if they crack in its trial success or failure, but let's say they succeed. Let's say I can really cure that left ear cancer. Yeah, we'll find that most companies and most entrepreneurs that we work with can really take a company to phase one, maybe phase two, and then it starts getting so sophisticated and complicated. And by then they've had so much investment into the company that the shareholders are completely different than the shareholders that started with uh, they started with. And so the board will typically appoint a new CEO that's perhaps a little bit more seasoned, has some experience to really take a company to phase two and phase three. Um, but once that happens, typically what that CEO will do is I'm looking for it to get acquired, right? They're looking to exit out. And so by the mid to end of phase two, if things look promising, most of these companies are looking to get acquired by the big Merck's and Pfizer's and the big um, pharma companies who have deep enough pockets to fund a level three study, which at the end of the day, isn't fantastic because it means in Canada, we're not necessarily incubating all of these successful local companies that are going to bring economic development to the jurisdictions that raise them, if you will. Uh, but at least the founders and whoever was involved do get a chunk of cash. And then maybe now that they have some experience with their first startup, can go and run a second startup. And And like I said, because entrepreneurship tends to be a personality, even if you make tons of money, after your first startup was successful, most of these people will actually go on and form a second startup, not because they necessarily need the money, but because they're passionate about it, because they love doing it. And so you get these serial entrepreneurs who keep giving back to the community. The Elon Musks of the world. Yeah. Um, so my my last question, unless we have more to talk about, but you, you, I, you saw me smirk at the comment where, um, you know, the postdoc doesn't know what to do with themselves um, when they finish. And the reason is because that is sometimes the reality when we finish grad school, we don't know what to do with ourselves. So my question is, what if somebody wants to do what you've done? And, uh, and are there, is that, you know, are, it doesn't sound like you have a unicorn role. It sounds like this is something that's kind of popping up everywhere. What career advice would you give somebody who, if they want to be one of you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's funny actually in terms of the the comment about grad students. I, my uh, master supervisor used to always say, grad studies was like the snooze button for life. You know, you finish your undergrad, you're not quite ready to move on. You hit snooze, do a master's. You're not quite ready to move on. Hit snooze, do a PhD. Uh, and you know, obviously that's 
very generalized. There's lots of people who are very passionate about science, but uh, it tends to be that way for, for many people. Uh, but I think for those people, the advice I would give is if you're thinking about spinning out of academia, start today. Like, don't wait until you're writing your patent, PhD thesis, master's thesis, and like, I'll figure it out once I graduate. That's too late. You need to start today, start building up your network, start attending events, especially if you want to go into the field I'm in where you're dealing with startups and, and the whole entrepreneur entrepreneurial ecosystem. There are so many events that you could be showing up to. One, it's free food. So for a grad student, that tends to bring people out. Uh, but uh, it's your chance to meet people, expand your network, because uh, there's actually a book called Your Network is Your Net Worth. And, and it's absolutely true. Like who you know is going to determine how successful you are. And the more you're out there, and I know it can be really uncomfortable for grad students who are kind of heads down working on their science and maybe not um, out there, putting themselves out there in, in these kinds of situations, but you, you have to start networking. You have to start being able to cut into conversations and introduce yourself and who you're doing and what your aspirations are. Um, and really get your foot in the door in a company that you want to work with any way you can. I can tell you from my experience that at Innovate Calgary, I've been here for more than a decade now, but I started off as a volunteer and not even in the life sciences sector. Uh, when I was uh, kind of in the last year of my PhD um, and definitely decided not to go into academia, I thought I need to get something on my resume that's not academia. Uh, so I started volunteering at Innovate Calgary profiling researchers in the energy sector. And just because I lived in Alberta, I knew I wanted to stay in Alberta. And I knew because we're so heavily reliant in the, in the energy sector, I needed to put something in my resume that has the word energy in it. So I started off as kind of an energy technology analyst doing volunteer work without really thinking I was necessarily going to stay at Innovate Calgary. But ultimately, after I you know, kind of six months in, they started paying me instead of volunteering. And then when I finished, um, they offered me a full-time gig, uh, which worked out. And I think that was really lucky. And, and I was quite fortunate to have Innovate Calgary offer me that position. But even if they hadn't, I think now I have at least one more line on my resume that distinguishes me from every other PhD that's graduating, that's got the same academic credentials, uh, looking for a job. It's like, well, you know, I have a little bit of industry experience, which is better than nothing. Uh, and so that was the plan. And I think that's what everybody really should be doing is, you know, think about padding your resume like a med student would before they apply to med school, right? Like it's all about getting things on there and making yourself known within the community. Jason, as somebody who's done the med school part of it, as well as somebody who didn't plan ahead and had to pivot, at the last, I'm not saying you didn't plan ahead, but you didn't, you didn't necessarily plan the path that you took. Um, do you agree? Do you have anything else to add? I, I do. I think also I did as the when I was the postdoc president at Penn, I was very involved in industry efforts as well. And so I was leading industry symposium of bringing industry people in and going to other stuff to start building a network because I figured even in my academic route, I'd spin out a company or two in my time. So I kind of always knew it was in my path, just not 100 percent. Um, so it is network. It is just getting out there most universities have something like talk to industry day just start there and then start going to stuff look at what's in the biotech sector where you are and what local meetups there are and i'll say that like i've done a good amount of hiring in the last few years and i absolutely pull out my you know virtual rolodex and look for people i want to hire my very first hire was a grad student in the lab i was a grad student in and i'm like you have the skills i need Do you want to come move from academia over from your postdoc and I've, and I've done that several times. And now faculty will reach out to me and say, hey, we have this person. Are you hiring or not? And sometimes I'm not. And sometimes I am or someone else in the company I'm at is. But it it really is that like who you know, because the robots throw out the resumes, basically. And you, you, you got to have the network. Yeah, I would agree with all that. And many of the times, like because we work with so many startup companies, they're looking, they come to me and say, hey, do you know someone who'd be good for this position? And I'll just make a few recommendations of people who've come to me looking for jobs. And, and one of the things I always try and do is make time for anybody who reaches out. So if there's ever a student at the university that says, can we go for a coffee, 50 minutes, half an hour, no matter how busy I am, I always try and make time for those people. Uh, and, and I try and keep that Rolodex, like 
Jason was saying, of, of people that I think are looking for jobs. And if a company comes to me and says, hey, I'm looking for this person, I was like, here's a few. Um, send them the resumes that I keep on file. And uh, and that's been quite successful for a lot of the, the students who've talked to me. I think the one thing I would add or maybe emphasize, because it was already said, um, because people can network and network and network, but ultimately they also have to have the CV that backs them up. And and you can have a great group of people around you, but you still need to gain the skills so that you will be successful in a role, even once you get the role. Um, and I think that little piece you said about you started off as a volunteer just to have a little bit more experience. Um, I think those kinds of things, and, and Jason, you were saying that you, you had a, a voluntary president, um, president of the Postdoc Association, I think you said, or something like that. Yeah, in my career, and I don't do anything similar to what you two do necessarily, but um, I was in, I was editing uh, academic journal articles for non English speaking scientists, and and I was doing that for bread and butter, like that was just basically to help me through grad school. But that ended up being the little tiny edge I needed to get the job, to just get the job, <laughs> and then and then I built my skills from there um, within within stem cells. So I think those are great tips on how to. Um, how to ultimately find your passion and find your path. Um, anything you'd like to add, Nima, at the end here? Anything we didn't ask you that you think our listeners around the world would like to know or that you know other people have asked that seemed to be a big question? I mean, I guess in terms of general advice for students kind of looking at alternative careers outside of academia, I would say, you know, the whole sunk cost idea of, well, I've spent, 10 years in acad or doing grad studies and now I feel pressured to go into academia. I think you just need to let that go. It was not, it's still a worthwhile investment. Um, it's still worthwhile to do that, but really don't be afraid to explore other careers and get out there, find out what's even out there. And, and to be honest, like even the position I'm in now, I didn't even know this position existed. I, and it, it kind of didn't, but at the time it did exist in other cities, but, but really figure out what you could be doing outside of academia. And I feel like most faculty members, at least in my experience, and maybe this is an overgeneralization, but they don't expose their students enough to what's outside of academia. And that's a huge disservice to the students that they deal with because all they ever do is encourage you to continue academia, do a postdoc, get a faculty position somewhere. And and without that exposure, and 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 I can't blame them because they themselves have known nothing outside of academia. They themselves did a master's PhD and got an academic position. So it's hard to tell people what's out there when you yourself don't know what's out there. Um, so it really becomes incumbent on the actual students themselves to go and explore and see what see the whole world outside of the university and, and where they could be. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, in terms of that sunk cost um, thing, like could either of you do the job you're doing now without the academic training you had? Absolutely not. Yeah. I couldn't do my job without the academic training I've had. Yeah, so. and absolutely. I think, I, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I studied cardiac development and, and while I don't apply those specific skills to what I'm doing, the general concepts and knowledge that I have and the confidence you have in terms of your knowledge base, I think is super important because I can talk to almost any company and basically understand what they're doing and relatively quickly. I saw it when you talked about left ear cancer with, with Jason. <laughs> um, I don't, you got right down into what are the what are the implications of this. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Nima. Um, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much for having us. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing this online. Okay, that brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to sign up for our email list at www.labcoatsandlifepodcast.com to get show notes, episode summaries, and links to useful information or learn more about STEM mentorship via the resources found at www.stemcell.com slash labcoatsandlife. You can also reach out to us on Twitter via STEM Cell at STEM Cell Tech or via email at info at labcoatsandlifepodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests.